day going so far? My day isn't going so good. My wife decided to make eggs and toast for breakfast, and I helped. I turned on the stove for her. I was working in my office, and I could smell the eggs cooking, and Louise yelled to me, don't forget, there are some eggs here waiting for you. And the smell kept drifting into my office, and I was getting hungry, and I could just picture how good those eggs were going to taste. And the next message from the kitchen was Louise yelling to me, never mind, Hannah and I ate all the eggs. <laughs> I had hope for some great tasting eggs. But my hope vanished when I came to the kitchen and saw the dog licking out the pan. Don't you feel sorry for me? <laughs> I edited the story a little bit for time's sake, but <laughs> other than that, other than that, it's mostly true. Yeah. Well, we need to move along. Um, <laughs> so we're talking about hope today. And as I think about hope, the one thing that tied into hope for me was the whole idea of tornadoes. What's the closest that you've ever been to a tornado? Anybody been super close to a tornado? It's scary, isn't it? I think we would all agree that tornadoes leave tremendous devastation. Last week I watched this video of a tornado where it stayed on the ground for a while, and I was amazed at the devastation that it left behind. And I was also amazed that someone would stay that close to a tornado and keep filming it. But just think what it's like for families who are victims of a tornado. The day starts out very normal for these families, and when the tornado leaves, there is unbelievable devastation left behind as they sift through the damage. And I think a tornado can be a metaphor for life sometimes. There are times when we feel like a tornado has hit our life. It happens for the person who goes to work thinking everything is fine, but then he finds that he is being let go from the company because of cutbacks. It happens to the spouse who comes home and finds a note asking for a divorce. It happens to the person who gets a phone call with the shocking news that a loved one has passed away. And it happens when a routine physical with the doctor reveals a very serious health problem. It's amazing how life can be going so smoothly one minute, and then the next minute it's just chaos. Your somewhat stable world gets turned into chaos. And I think it's those times when we need hope the most. And that's why I want to look at hope today. The truth is that our world can be very unpredictable, and we can be susceptible to all kinds of things. So the question I want to ask is this. If that's the kind of world that we live in, where do we find hope? If that's our world, where do we find hope? Is there a solid rock to stand on when the storm waves come rushing in? And Jesus tells us that there is. Many of you remember his teaching from the Sermon on the Mount where he talked about having a solid foundation to survive the storms of life. And in Matthew 7, this is what Jesus said, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So Jesus tells us, make a choice. What foundation will I build on, solid rock or sand? We choose solid rock when we build our life on Jesus and his teaching. When we build our life on Jesus, we have solid hope. And we find this theme of hope in the Bible all the way from Genesis to Revelation. The ancient Israelites viewed the ocean or the sea as a place of chaos and disorder. You know, many of us think about the ocean as this nice place. You go on vacation, beautiful water, beautiful beaches, all sorts of things you can do there. But in the ancient world, the Israelites didn't view the ocean that way. The Israelites were afraid of the ocean. They believed that the ocean was a place of chaos and disorder and destruction, and it stood in opposition to their God, who was a God of order and beauty. So throughout the Bible, the ocean is almost always depicted in negative terms. We see this right away in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. So the image at the beginning is this completely formless world where it's dark and ominous. But the writer of Genesis goes on to say that the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then you know what happens. God speaks, and he separates the water from the land. He separates day from night. And as the process of creation continues, God puts order and boundaries in a world that had previously just been chaotic. And by the end of the creation account, there's a perfectly ordered world that God declares good. And then at the very end of creation, God establishes a garden where he puts the man and the woman. Eden <coughs> is the complete opposite of the chaotic ocean at the beginning. The garden is a place of order and beauty. It shows God triumphing over the chaos, bringing complete order where before there had only been disorder. And next, God places man and woman in the garden and gives them a command, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth and fill it. So humanity was supposed to take God's work of ordering the world and expand it far beyond Eden. But of course, the man and the woman didn't follow through with that command. Instead, they rebelled against God and they plunged the world back into chaos. Because of that rebellion against God, we now live in a world that tends to go from order to chaos. But thankfully, we worship a God who is not content to leave it that way. He has not abandoned our world to chaos. God is in the process of bringing order out of the chaos. And this theme continues throughout the Bible with its focus on good versus evil. And there are times when the evil is represented by the sea and the good is represented by God's power over the sea. You can look at some of the Psalms that talk about God's power over the sea. Psalm 93, the floods have risen up, O Lord. The floods have roared like thunder. The floods have lifted their pounding waves. But mightier than the violent raging of the seas, mightier than the breakers on the shore, the Lord above is mightier than these. Psalm 77, God, the waters saw you. They saw you and became afraid. The deep waters shook with fear. So each of these psalms speak of the power of God as being mightier than the sea. The psalmist is saying that our God is more powerful than chaos. He can bring order out of chaos, and he's the only one who has the power to do that. So again, we have to make a choice. Will our hope be found in God alone, or will our hope be found in the things of this world? Our hope needs to be found in God alone. The things of this world will always disappoint us, but God alone has the power to bring order out of the chaos. In 1815, James Riley was a merchant captain from Connecticut who left his family and took command of a ship called the Commerce. And at the time, that ship was one of the largest, most advanced, and strongest ships in the American fleet. Riley was a very experienced sea captain. He'd been at sea since he was 15 years old, so he knew the world's oceans very well. But on this one voyage with the commerce, the unthinkable happened. They entered into a dark fog in the middle of the night, and they blew off course near the north coast of Africa. The commerce shipwrecked near Cape Bohador in North Africa. In the morning, the crew woke up, and they knew they were shipwrecked, but they weren't far from shore. But Riley reported that they knew they couldn't go to shore because it was filled with what he called violent savages who were picking through all the remnants of the shipwreck that had washed up on the shore. So they only had one option left. They had to head back out to sea. The problem was there were huge sea breakers about 20 feet high all along the Cape. Riley knew there was no way they were going to be able to take a lifeboat from their shipwrecked ship to the open sea and get through those breakers. He was faced with a terrible choice. Go on shore knowing they would be attacked or head back out to sea. So they lowered the lifeboat and filled it with supplies. Riley and his crew members got in the boat and they started rowing toward the breakers. Riley was a non-religious man. In fact, at one point he admitted that he didn't believe that God was actively involved in the affairs of the world. But as he got closer and closer to those breakers, he told the men in his boat to take off their hats, and then Riley offered up 
this following prayer. He said, Great creator and preserver of the universe, who now sees our distress, we pray thee to spare our lives and permit us to pass through this overwhelming surf to the open sea. But if we are doomed to perish, thy will be done. We commit our souls to the mercy of thee, our God who gave them. And then Riley recorded that as he finished his prayer, as if by divine command, the wind stopped and a 20-yard gap emerged in the breakers where they were able to row right through as the sea continued to roar on either side of them about 20 feet high. And sometime later, Riley wrote a book about his adventures at sea, and he included this story. But his publisher begged him not to include this story because it was so miraculous that nobody would believe it. Riley basically agreed with his publisher. He knew the story did not make sense, but he insisted on including the story. And here's what he wrote. He said, I cannot suppress or deny what so clearly appeared to me and to my companions as the immediate and merciful act of the Almighty, listening to our prayers and granting our petition at the awful moment when dismay, despair, and death were pressing close upon us. My heart still glows with holy gratitude for his mercy, and I will never be ashamed nor afraid to acknowledge and make known to the world the infinite goodness of my divine creator. Isn't that powerful? A non-religious man suddenly tells his guys, hey, take off your, your hats, it's time to pray. And they pray, and God steps in, and they are delivered. James Riley learned what the psalmist said, God alone brings order out of chaos. He alone has triumphed over the sea, and that's why we must make the choice that our hope will be found in God alone. And when we return to the book of Genesis, we see more of God's activity. In Genesis chapter 6, Noah has been preserved in the ark with a few others, while the rest of the world is destroyed in the flood. And God protects them from the waters, and he saves them. Then in Exodus, we read about the king of Egypt, who orders that all the Hebrew babies be thrown into the Nile and killed, but one of them is saved. Moses is saved in a little basket. His life is preserved through the waters. And the story of Moses is somewhat similar to the story of Noah. God protects one little child through the waters. And then what happens? Moses grows up and rescues God's people from Egypt. And how does that happen? You might remember that they were up against the sea on one side and Pharaoh's army on the other side. And once again, God steps in to save. A mighty wind comes, the sea separates, and God's people walk out on the dry land. And then when Pharaoh's army goes into the sea to pursue them, the waters cover them over. And just like in the story of Noah, the evil ones are destroyed by the sea. And as you read those stories, it's clear that our God has the power to triumph over the sea but also remember this, God is with us as we pass through the sea. We remember in Exodus that God led the Israelites by a cloud by day and a fire by night. The presence of God was with his people as he guided them through the chaos. And there are times in our lives where our life will be filled with chaos. There are times when life doesn't make sense and you're going to feel overwhelmed by life. And when we feel trapped and without hope, we need to remember these words from the book of Isaiah. Do not fear, for I have rede redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, with God, or will we face trials alone? I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to face trials alone. My strength is not sufficient. I want God with me every step of the way. When James Riley was finally able to get through those breakers out into the open sea, they only had a few days' worth of supplies. And when they ran out of supplies, they also ran out of hope. They never found another ship to pick them up, so eventually they had to row back into the shore. And when they did, those savages were waiting for them. Riley and his crew went ashore, one of his men was almost instantly killed by the savages. The others were bound, 
stripped naked, thrown onto some camels, and headed out into the desert. Eventually, Riley and the rest of his crew were all sold as slaves, and they spent the next year traveling through the North African desert as slaves. And they were treated harshly. They were beaten. They were put into hard labor. Riley reported that his weight went from about 240 pounds down to just 90 pounds. After a year in these circumstances, he's, he thought, I'm never going to get home, and I'll never see my wife and children in Connecticut again. He knew he was going to die. But as he was traveling in a caravan through the Sahara Desert, he shared his story with another traveler in the group, and as this man heard Riley sharing his story about God's deliverance from the sea, the man basically rebuked Riley for giving up hope. And this is what the man said to Riley. He said, dare you distrust the power of God who has preserved you for so long by his miracles? No, my friend, the God of heaven and of earth is your friend, and he will not forsake you. So this man spoke deep biblical truth to Riley. Your God will not forsake you. He's your friend. God will be with you when you travel through the waters. When chaos and despair seem to be winning the battle, do not give up hope because God has not abandoned you. And the words spoken by this man gave Riley the strength needed to persevere and to fight and to continue to hope. And when I heard that story, it reminded me of the fact that God will sometimes bring a friend into your life to speak truth into your life and remind you, don't give up. Yes, the storm is terrible. Yes, it's hard right now. But do not give up because God is faithful. He will never leave you. We started in Genesis today, and now I want to end in Revelation We've seen God's power over the sea in the story of Noah in Exodus as Jesus calms the sea, and now it reaches its culmination in the book of Revelation. There's an interesting account from the Apostle John in the book of Revelation as he's given this vision of the new heavens and the new earth. And in Revelation 21, it's almost a side comment as he makes this observation. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Did you catch what he said? There's no longer any sea. Have you thought about that phrase? The sea had represented danger and chaos to God's people, but now in God's perfected creation, the chaos doesn't exist any longer. Everything is going to have order and beauty and be perfect. In other words, everything that's wrong in our world is going to be made right. Remember that he's writing to first century Christians who are experiencing terrible persecution. And he's offering them this beautiful picture of hope. The day is coming when everything is going to be made right. So do not give up hope. Our God will triumph over evil. And then John continues the description of heaven in verse 3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. No more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So once again, we have to make a choice. Who will win, God or evil? I believe with all my heart that God will win. The Bible makes it clear that God will triumph over evil, and that's why we have hope today. When we left James Riley, he was down to 90 pounds. He was ready to give up. But in 1860, Riley was eventually redeemed from slavery. An Englishman bought him for $920 and two shotguns. Riley ended up getting all the way back home to Connecticut where he was reunited with his wife and children. And the next year, he wrote a book about his experience. You know, if the story ended there, we'd, we'd think Riley's captivity in Africa was terrible. We're glad that he was set free. But God actually ended up taking this terrible experience and bringing good out of it. And the first good thing that came from it was that Riley changed his life. He spent the remaining days of his life fighting for the liberation of the slaves in America. Here he was, a white American who had become a slave in Africa, and because of that experience, he came back and realized he needed to help free the African slaves in America. And he devoted the rest of his life to doing just that. He worked the remaining years to fight for freedom of the slaves. And then in 1817, his book became a nationwide bestseller. 
and the first time many white Americans were given a glimpse of slavery through the eyes of one of their own, and it transformed their attitudes towards slavery. In fact, get this. A young lawyer in Illinois picked up a copy of that book. You might have heard of him. His name was Abraham Lincoln. And he said that apart from the Bible, James Riley's book informed his political views more than anything else ever had. And it was Lincoln who then ended up freeing the slaves in America. So does our God bring order out of chaos? Does he bring beauty from ashes? Does he have the power to bring good out of terrible situations? Of course he does. That's why we worship him. That's why we have a solid hope that no one can take away. So I want to close with this scripture from 1 Peter because I can't say it any better. It describes the solid hope that we have. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us birth into what? Into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Never give up hope. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. And Lord, there are times in life when we feel just overwhelmed by life. We feel beaten down, we feel weak, we want to give up. At those times, Lord, I just pray that you'll bring a friend into our life who will just remind us the need to never give up. Thank you that you are with us as we pass through the storm. Thank you that sometimes you calm the storm and other times you calm us. So as we end the service, we give you all praise and glory for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us as we close out our service.